uh, had her in class, and she's, it's always so nice to have her. It's, in particular, it's always nice to have those analytical chemistry students who then absolutely freak out when I, you know, first day in lab, it's like, horseshoes, hand grenades, nuclear weapons, as long as it's close solution making, it'll be just fine. And the students start to twitch just a little bit, right? And it's like, and it's like, well, what, what, where are the volumetric plastic? Ah, oh, don't worry about it. As long as it's close, we're good. And so she hung in there and, and suffered through that really nicely and, and, and was, was great from that particular standpoint. Um, but anyhow, uh, she is going to be pursuing a map from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, is going to be pursuing a master's at uh, the University of Minnesota, a master's in environmental chemistry. Um, so without further ado, Laura. Hi, everyone. As Dr. Dave said, my name is Laura Frankson. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about shrinking technology using polymers to print smaller circuits. So I'm assuming everyone in the room either has a cell phone or is pretty familiar with cell phones. And the cell phones that we have today are much different from the cell phones that first came out. So when cell phones first came out, they're these giant, huge brick phones. Um, they're pretty much, you could call someone, you could receive a call. There weren't that many other features uh, on these cell phones. However, throughout time, our cell phones have gotten smaller and we've added more features. So for example, on this Nokia phone, you might have a game or two, you might be able to text someone, uh, make some calls, but besides that, there aren't a ton of the other features. And despite adding these new features, we have uh, continued to make these cell phones smaller. But now we're in this trend of um, this evolution of our cell phones, where cell phones are actually getting bigger. We're still adding more features. We now have apps. We have Wi-Fi, internet, all of these different features now on these phones. But our cell phones are getting larger. And one reason behind this is because of circuits. Now circuits are like the backbone of our cell phones um, and much of our electronics. They are what connects all of our different components together. Um, and so they're really, really important uh, for our cell phones in order for them to be able to work. And without them, our cell phones would not be able to, to function. And right now we're stuck at this 10 nanometer barrier for printing our circuits. We can't print our circuits smaller than 10 nanometers um, in detail. And we're trying to get past this barrier so we can continue connecting more and more functions of our cell phone together in smaller areas. So I mentioned 10 nanometers, but how small really is that? For reference, a strand of human hair is 80,000 to 100,000 nanometers wide. So much, much larger than this 10 nan nanometers. Something a little closer in scale is a strand of human DNA, which is about 2.5 nanometers wide. So we're talking about something that's a lot closer in size to this 10 nanometers. Um, and so with that, we're it's pretty impressive that we're already at this um, size in printing, um, but we still want to continue making it smaller so we can continue making smaller and thinner devices with smaller and thinner circuits. So the way that we make these circuits is through nanolithography. And lithography is the transfer of a pattern onto another surface. And the nano part is just referencing the, the size scale. So at the nano scale, a very, very small scale. And with that, we have two examples of patterns. So they, these are from polymers, and I'll explain what polymers are in a little bit. But right now, what's important is that we have two different parts. We have this lighter part, and we have our darker part. And with that, um, we apply this UV treatment. Now, if you're not familiar with what UV is, it's a part of the light spectrum, and you might be familiar with it through sunscreens. A lot of sunscreens protect against UV rays. And with that, we apply our UV treatment that preferentially gets rid of one part of this pattern. So one, one of the polymers, and in this instance, it's the darker polymer. And we're left with these white voids. So with that, we now have a pattern we can use. Instead of just being a flat surface, we have these grooves, and we can pattern our circuits using this. And these are just two of the different types of patterns that you can have for circuitry. There are a lot of other patterns that are available to use. And so I mentioned what a polymer is, or I mentioned a polymer before, but what exactly is a polymer? So we have this nice little uh, graphic of these little <laughs> molecule guys, um, and representing just basically what a polymer is. So each of these little guys represents a, an individual unit, and then they're holding hands, which signifies the linking together or they're bonded. So with that, polymers are chains of a bunch of these units, usually a thousand to millions of units long, so much, much longer than this short little graphic. Um, and while this polymers may sound technical, they're actually in our everyday life. So they're in things like our spandex or our clothing. They're in things like our plastics or milk jugs, as well as in the rubber and our tires. 
So they actually are in a lot of our everyday life. Um, and these are only a couple examples. Um, and we're just trying to use these polymers in another aspect of our life. So with that, there are a couple different types of polymers that I'm going to be talking about throughout this talk. We have a regular polymer that I talked about before. It's just this bunch of these uh, repeating units. They're all the same. But we also have a copolymer. So this indicates that there's, they're not all uniform. So there's, in the sense that there are two different types of these polymers. So we have, instead of all just these gray little individual units, we have some gray units and we have some orange units. So just distinguishing the fact that they're not all the same unit. And within a, a copolymer, we have two different types of those. So we have a random copolymer, which to its name is an unordered, unorganized uh, formation of this polymer. And so once again, we have two different parts. We have our orange part and we have our green part of the polymer, and it's in a random order. On the other hand, there's a block copolymer. And so this, once again, we have our orange part and our green part, but this time it's a very ordered, organized way. So we have four green, four orange, four green, four orange, and that continues on. So you can think about this like its name, it's blocks, there are blocks of orange, blocks of green, and they repeat. So the way that we use these polymers for this nanolithography and for printing the circuits is by starting with a surface. And so with that surface, we add on top our block copolymer, so our orange, green, orange, green, alternating. And then we add our UV treatment, it preferentially gets rid of one of the polymers, so the orange polymer in this instance, and then we're left with this pattern. So this is actually a side-on view, whereas a couple slides ago when we talked about nanolithography, that was a top-down view. So this may, it looks really simple and like, why would we even want to do this? But this is just the simplified side-on view versus that top-down view, which is a much more complex pattern. And where my research comes in is the fact that this does not occur. Instead of getting this perpendicular orientation of the block of polymer to the surface, we get this parallel orientation. And we can't use that because if we apply the UV rays, it's only going to degrade that top layer, that top orange layer preferentially, and it's going to leave the rest of it. So we don't get a pattern that we can use to pattern our circuits. So why does this happen? The reason behind why this happened is hydrophobicity. So to explain this, we have a glass of oil and water. The water is at the bottom in the blue, and the oil is in the yellow, much uh, towards the top. And it's bubbling up because there's a seltzer tablet at the bottom, so that's just magically doing that. Um, and so you can see here that they're not mixing together. And the reason behind this is that water is highly hydrophilic, and so philic related to liking and similar to water, whereas oil is highly hydrophobic. And so phobic, phobia meaning fear of, and hydro meaning water. So they are complete opposites, and two hydrophilic things want to be by each other, and two hydrophobic things want to be by each other, so two light things want to be by each other, whereas when you have something highly hydrophobic and something hi highly hydrophilic, they do not want to mix, they do not want to be by each other, which is why these little beads of water form and the water uh, goes back down to, this, uh, to the rest of the water to avoid mixing. And so to apply this to why our block of polymer does this different orientation, we go back to the individual units of the block of polymer. So if we have a, a green part that's hydrophobic, whereas the orange part is more hydrophilic, then if we have a surface that is more hydrophobic, the green part is going to orient itself closest to this hydrophobic, hydrophobic surface, and it's going to cause this parallel orientation. On the other hand, if we have a hydrophilic surface, the opposite is going to happen. The orange part or the hydrophilic part of the block of polymer is going to orient itself closest to the hydrophilic surface. And so in order to avoid this parallel orientation, we need a non-preferential surface. We need a surface that is neither hydrophobic nor hydrophilic in order for there not to be any preferentiality in the way that the block of polymer orients itself. And that's we achieve a perpendicular orientation. And the way that we propose doing this is through a similar method to before, where we start with our surface. And then instead of immediately adding on our block of polymer, we add on this blue strip. Now this blue strip represents our random copolymer which if you recall is this unordered, unorganized way of having uh, the formation of this polymer. From there, um, we add on our block copolymer and hope for a, a, a perpendicular orientation of the block copolymer relative to the surface. And this is because we are wanting to make a random copolymer that, co that is non-preferential, so neither hydrophilic nor hydrophobic. From there, we apply our UV treatment, 
and we get our pattern. So this is the basic steps that we are hoping to do and we're hoping that will work in order to achieve this perpendicular orientation. So the polymer, the random coat polymer that we chose to work with was this MMA HEMA GMA random coat polymer. So it's not in the order that it's shown up here. This is just to so show the three components um, and it will be a, a longer chain that is in a random order. So our GMA on the end, that actually is not playing to our hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity. That is there as a crosslinker. And what a crosslinker does is, so when we ma are making these random copolymer strands, there's more than one strand in the solution. And we want them to be connected to each other and to make a coherent um, solid and to and have a coherent surface. And so what this does, this GMA, it connects those individual strands. So that our MMA and our HEMA are our main components that affect our hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. And the OH at the bottom of our HEMA makes it more hydrophilic than, than the MMA, which does not have this OH, and so that is more hydrophobic. And with that, we decided to make four different compositions of this polymer in order to test and see when we have a hydrophobic or a hydrophilic or a non-preferential surface. So with that, we started with a 71% MMA, a 15% HEMA, and then a 14% GMA composition. Because our GMA is only being used as a crosslinker, we will keep that composition of the GMA consistent throughout these four compositions. Then we have 61% MMA, 25% HEMA, 51% MMA, 35% HEMA, and then lastly, 41% MMA and 45% HEMA. So in order to go through and see if this, is, this random group polymer is hydrophilic or hydrophobic, there are a lot of steps we need to go through. First, we need to polymerize, or we need to make this polymer. So we're going to add in our three components of the random coat polymer, our MMA, our HEMA, and our GMA. Something to start the reaction, our AIBN, and something to put it all in, the solution, um, anisole. That's our solvent. And the way that we did our polymerization was free radical polymerization. So I'm going to go through and explain what exactly this is, and it's not going to be specifically for this random copolymer. It's going to be a, just a simpler ex, uh, example of this. So we start with a molecule, and then we add in the Z star, which is our initiator. And so that star represents a free radical, and a free radical is an unpaired electron, and electrons like to be in pairs. And so right now, it's pretty unhappy. And so what happens is it finds this first molecule on your left side, and it takes an electron from that double bond, forms a bond with that carbon, and then we're left with an unpaired electron, or this star on the end, which is also unhappy and doesn't want to be like that. Um, so our Z star in this instance, or initiator, is AIBN, so this molecule right here, which breaks up into those two molecules. And you can see from that middle carbon on the right side that there's a star there indicating a free radical. So that's where our Z star is in this instance. And what's really nice about AIBN is that we don't need to subject our um, experiment to weird conditions. It just needs to be exposed to light in order for that reaction to happen. Uh, so it's really easy to work with in that sense. So once we have formed this molecule on the right, it finds another one of these molecules in the solution and reacts again, doing the same thing, and that continues on and on to form a long chain. Now the way that this reaction ends is through two of these chains finding each other and reacting with their two unpaired electrons, pairing those electrons, and then forming this long polymer chain. And this happens because there's not just one polymer chain um, being made at a time. There are a bunch of different um, A and B and molecules being broken up and a bunch of different free radicals starting different reactions to make these polymer chains. And once again, these polymer chains are thousands to millions of units long. So they're not just little short units. They're very, very long units. And so what we did to make this molecule is we first tried by just putting together our MMA, our HEMA, our GMA in the specific compositions that we wanted, adding our initiator, our AIBN, to start the reaction, but we didn't get that out. Um, so instead we got this really gross gel that was impossible to work with and we could not get the polymer out no matter how, tar we, har, how hard we tried. So the reason that this occurs is because we have this OH on our HEMA, which ring opens this um, GMA and then forms a bond there. And that's not where we want this reaction to happen. We want our uh, polymer to be formed up towards that top along those carbons. And so we kind of go back to the drawing board, figure out how are we going to make this polymer without, using, without having this reaction occur. 
So the next thing we tried was using THP protected HEMA. So instead of just having this OH at the bottom of the HEMA, we changed that to this ring group. And so now this ring group cannot react with that GMA. With that, we added our ARVN, our initiator, to start the reaction. And then we got out our THP HEMA with our MMA and GMA random copolymer. So we haven't quite gotten to the exact random copolymer we want. We want that to be just regular HEMA and not THP protected HEMA. But uh, in a couple of steps, you'll see how we get rid of um, unprotected this group and get back our regular HEMA. So right now, we've made this random copolymer. It's not quite what we want yet, but we'll get there. So we made this molecule, or this polymer, and then right now it's in solution, so we need it precipitated out or get it into solid form. And with that, we drop the polymer dropwise into a solution of hexanes and diethyl ether, and then it precipitates out. From there, we then redissolve it, um, and then we spin coat it. So this is how we get our random copolymer on top of our um, surface. And our surface in this instance is a silicon silicon dioxide wafer. And so we put the silicon silicon dioxide wafer on top of 